All right, welcome to another Pat Dooley Show. I hope you guys uh, are going to enjoy this one. we got a great panel today. Lee and Travis McGriff are going to join us. Two of the best receivers ever played at Florida. Just happened to be father and son. So uh, we get right to it. The Florida LSU game obviously was a big day here in Gainesville. What, what great tailgating. You know, one thing I love about it when LSU comes is Gator fans go, we'll show you what real Cajun cooking is. Well, of course, you aren't going to do that. You're not going to succeed at that, but I like that you tried because I got to taste some great stuff. Uh, certainly the game was an unbelievable crowd. It was great to see the swamp back to where it was, but it's funny. At the half, here's Florida down 6 nothing. They've been shut out. And all I'm thinking is this game, Florida's got them right where they want them. You know, I, I, obviously this has been a second-half team all year. Uh, I don't know. I know the stat now in the fourth quarter is like 41 nothing. They've outscored them. So you're thinking that. And also, I kept thinking, I don't think LSU's can score in Florida unless Florida turns it over again, which, of course, they did to give them those three points. But Florida's defense was looking that good. On the other hand, you know, uh, Florida's offense needed – I thought they would come out and be, do something creative. They didn't. Instead, they just pounded the ball. And, you know, we've talked about this. I talked about it in, in, in uh, the podcast. A lot of the credit goes to Florida's defense for what they did offensively. When you look at what Florida did offensively, they just kept pounding the ball and they wore them out. Well, the reason they wore them out, Florida's defense wasn't letting LSU stay out there. So they get a lot of credit. There's a lot of credit to go around. Matt Elam had probably had his best game as a Gator. Not only that strip, but man, some hits and just played really well. You know, you look at a guy like Dominic Easley, big factor in that game. Dominic Easley just two weeks ago had his knee scoped. A lot of people don't know about that, but he, he had it cleaned out, and that's why he was, uh, you know, struggling a little bit with the swelling we, that Will talked about. But the fact is, he's out there playing his butt off. I mean, you got to give the, this was a team effort, no question about it. Kyle Christie, got to give him a lot of credit. He's becoming one of the league's premier punters, and of course, Mike Gillisley, with what he's been able to do. There's people talking Heisman for him. I'm not, okay? He hasn't had a Heisman year. But he's certainly a guy who's on the fringes of the Heisman voting. We'll talk about guys who are no longer on the fringes a little bit later in the show. But certainly it was, you know, I talked about in my column, it was a statement Saturday. It was almost kind of a see you Saturday for some teams, especially Florida State. No question that loss was devastating. For LSU, you know, I, they're not out of the mix. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But, they're, but the bottom line is when you look at that team, you don't go, that's a top five team. Not anymore. Not the way they play offensively. Uh, certainly for Texas, tough loss for them. Uh, but I think they still have a chance to get back in the mix. They need to beat Oklahoma this week. But it was a great Saturday of college football. I don't know if you enjoyed it as much as I did. Maybe part of it was just that Gainesville was fun again. It was fun to be around. I mean, how many times have you see Florida lose? When you lose five games at home over the last two years, the next Sunday, it's always overcast. You ever notice that? It's always overcast and everybody's walking around like this. But when they win, hey, every, it's always sunny and everybody's walking around with a, a smile on their face. So pretty cool uh, Sunday, Saturday and Sunday, uh, to be in Gainesville. Uh, obviously, we've got another big week this week. Florida goes to, uh, to uh, Vanderbilt, to Nashville, and it's a great trip for us. I've got to be honest with you. I love it there. The coolest thing is in Nashville, we get to stay at a Marriott there that you literally walk out your back door and you're in the press box. So we're fired up about that part of it. Makes uh, travel a lot easier. But look, Vanderbilt's a team that is, has not been very good. We thought they were going to be a lot better. I know that I'm one of the guys who drank the Kool-Aid. By the way, I had to explain what drinking the Kool-Aid means to my 11-year-old the other day. It's hard to explain mass suicide to, some, to an 11 year old, but I, I, I think she understands it now. But, you know, Vanderbilt was supposed to be really good and hasn't been, and got a big win last week over Missouri, but boy, I'm wondering if Missouri's any good at all. Of course, their quarterback got hurt, and that hurt them. The bottom line is Florida's better than Vanderbilt. Florida's just got to take care of business and get up there and get the win. And again, if they win this game 13 to 10, I don't want to hear any grousing. You win the game, that's what it's about. You play to win the game. And if Florida can get the win, that sets up a great game against South Carolina, which, again, is part of the reason it's a trap game. But you can read more about that in my Saturday column. All right, it's time to do the three things that I think. Okay, before I do three things, it's plug-away time. The Gainesville Sun uh, photographers have an exhibit 
uh, down at the Thomas, Center, the Thomas Center Main Gallery. In fact, it's going to be up there until uh, January 5th. The reception is Friday from 5 to 7, and this is the cha three championship seasons. You remember these. Tebow, Leak, Werfel, Spurrier, all those guys. And the 50, I think it's 50 the best pictures that they took during that time. Very cool. I'm going to have to go down and see. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm looking forward to seeing it. So uh, that, again, it's going to be hanging there uh, right up until January 5th. So you've got all football season to go down there, and uh, I, I'm sure you would enjoy it. Uh, it's time for three things. The three things I, see, I think, number one, fans had a bad weekend. Obviously, I don't know how many of you have heard about that. You know about the Kansas City situation with Matt Castle being cheered when he got hurt. And then we hear that Aaron Murray got his house egged and toilet papered after that loss. Come on, man, grow up. It's, it's, it's supposed to be entertainment. It's not life or death. And quit doing that kind of stuff. I, I got a little ticked off at the Florida fans, just a little bit, who were booing when the LSU players were hurt because they thought they were delaying. Now, they saw the same thing happen at Texas A&M, Florida had a couple of guys cramp up, and, L and Texas A&M thought they were trying to slow them down. Um, you know, just l watch the game. I cheer, scream. If you want to boo, I got no problem with that. But at the same time, I don't think fans had a great weekend. Number two, it is over for FSU. I I'm telling you, I, 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 I wrote this in my column. At one point, I'm like, God, they're still ninth in the Harris Poll. Maybe they've got a chance to come back and still play for the national title, but it's over. They don't even control their own destiny in the ACC, whatever division they're in, uh, because if NC State wins out, they would actually win it. But for LSU, it's not, and here's why. LSU is still in there in the top 10. They got the huge game with South Carolina this week. They got that huge game with Alabama November 3rd. They win those two games, people are gonna look at them differently. Don't forget, they only lost 14 to six to Florida. Now, they didn't look good in doing it. Offensively, they were awful. They're going to have to be a totally different team down the stretch to do it. But LSU still has a chance to be in the national title game. And that's the funny thing. We're looking at right now four. I don't know that Georgia has much of a chance. As badly as they got beat, I don't think they have a chance no matter what happens. And the rest of their SEC schedule is not that tough. But you look at Alabama, LSU, Florida, I'm, I'm saying it. I'm not believing it, but I'm saying it and South Carolina all with a chance to be playing for the national title. So that's where you want to be if you're the SEC. And number three, I thought Jarvis Jones was the best defensive player in the league. In fact, there was a point maybe before last week that he was on my Heisman ballot, my mental Heisman ballot. Well now, not only is he not on it, but Jadavian Clowney may be on it. I mean, that guy is so disruptive and just destroys offense. I mean, nobody can block him. That kid is amazing. He's only a sophomore, but he has really done a great job. He is now the defensive king. Last year, Tyron Matthew was probably the defensive king of the SEC. This year, it looked like it was definitely Jarvis Jones, but i got to go with Clowney right now as the defensive king of the SEC. All right, when we come back, we'll be joined by our great panel, Lee and Travis McGiff. McGriff will join, McGiff or McGriff will join us right after this. All right, welcome back to the Pat Dooley Show. What a panel I've got for today. Lee and Travis McGriff, a couple of all SEC wide receivers in the University of Florida. Have you ever guys ever added up how many catches and touchdowns you, you caught for the Gators? <laughs> we have. <laughs> he has more. <laughs> he has more? No, I'm just, if you added them all together, yeah. it'd be pretty good. Yeah. How many touchdowns would that be? Do the math. About 28? Yeah, is 27? that right? 14 apiece? Which his is probably more impressive because they, they, didn't they were playing in the wishbone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, certainly two of the greats at, at the University of Florida. And I appreciate him coming in. We'll go to our five questions. Of course, we do every uh, week on this on the Pat Dooley Show. Now, we'll start with number one. Because they have these two wide receivers in here, former wide receivers, uh, which is more important for a wide receiver, speed, hands, or brains, Lee? And I know you had all three. Or two of the three. <laughs> your, your, your memory is very weak, but I appreciate the compliment. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to tell you brains because with brains, I mean, you have to have a certain level, level of athletic ability. Right. But if your brain's not good, if you can't be focused, if you, I'm putting heart with your brain. You've got to, you, you've got to have the will to do well. That's the most powerful tool you can have. Yeah, and, you know, Trav, we've seen guys that can run. Sure. You know, John Capel being, being a great example. Uh, but, you know, if you can't catch it, it doesn't do any good. 
Uh, but you also have to know where to go. I mean, is it, I guess it takes a combination of all three, but which one do you think is the most important? Well, I agree with both of you guys. It is, it's a combination. Brains is very, very important, especially today. The, the schemes are more complex. There's uh, a lot to, to learn and, right. and to know what to do. And if you can't be in the right spot, then you have a hard time playing. But at the core of all of that, even if you can run, even if you're smart, if you can't catch it when they <laughs> throw to you, it's going to be hard for you to be out there. And so I, I might put hands first, but really, um, in all actuality, you need lots of skills to be effective out there. How many times has he shown you the catch he made against Georgia in the end? <laughs> you know what, Pat? I, we, growing up, there was a picture of that catch that yeah. we have in the house that was up for a period of time, and then it was down. It's probably in his closet now somewhere. He never personally showed it to me, um, but I was very aware of it, probably more from other people. And, uh, and what they would tell me about it. And, and then obviously that picture was around, but I know it was a huge play. And back in those days, unlike when we played in the 90s, the Georgia game was so big and Georgia yeah. had the edge in the rivalry. Tell and then it shifted it. big time in the 90s. Almost it became secondary, not where are we gonna win, how, how bad were we gonna beat them? You know where I was on that catch? Where were you? The opposite end zone. Were you really? Yeah, and, and if you remember that day, <clears throat> it was a combination of Paper mill, coffee smell. There was every kind of smell in Jacksonville that day. And you're sitting in the south end zone, you're like tears in your eyes watching the end of that game. But it's it one of my favorite memories of all time. All right, we go to number two. Uh, Trav, start with you. Who's the best quarterback in the SEC right now? And I bring that up because before the year, you kind of said, who's going to be all SEC, Aaron Murray or, or, or Wilson? And I don't know if either one of them has much of a shot at it right now. Yeah, you know, before last Saturday and, uh, and that disastrous performance by Georgia against South Carolina, I would have said Aaron Murray. I think he's talented. I think he can do a lot of things. And up to that point, it played very well. Obviously, Tyler Wilson being hurt, not playing. Um, hard to say, Pat. I, I still think I'm going to go with Aaron Murray, though. I think, I think he's the best um, in spite of that performance. Hopefully, I say hopefully, not really hopefully. I hope they do terrible. <laughs> um, but, but I do think he's a good player, and I think he'll get it on track and do some nice things. And I think when you look around the conference, um, I, I'm, just, I'm just not quite sure who else is there. Yeah, the only other guy might be A.J. McCarron. He's more of a manager, in the, in the, much like Jeff Driscoll is. But if he wanted, I think it would be by default yes. because nobody else was there. Alabama's so good. I don't think he's going to win it because he puts up great numbers and statistically is blowing everybody out of the water. But you're right. It could very well end with him, uh, especially if Aaron Murray kind of tanks and Georgia doesn't play well the rest of the season. It was a really bad week for, for Aaron Murray and certainly the most important thing. I don't want to try to compare them to a football game, but he found out his father had thyroid cancer. Uh, his house was egged and toilet papered. And then on his way back from Tampa to go home to Athens, he got a speeding ticket right out here on I-75. Is that right? I didn't know that. Well, he tweeted that he got pulled over in Gainesville, and he didn't think he was going to be able to get out of that one. But who, who would be your guy that would uh, stand out as an SEC quarterback? Well, it's going to sound like heresy because I'm going to talk about a freshman quarterback. And from the moment I saw Manziel at Texas A&M, mm -hmm. you know, Trav knows I like to say this all the time. If I was having a pickup football game, I'd pick him. His hands are good. His eyes are good. He's a reactive, aware kind of athlete, right. and he's got physical skills, but Texas A&M is pretty good, and if they keep winning, he's going to be a major reason they keep winning, and maybe he emerges. You know, I, the other guys we've talked about, and, and I know that Aaron Murray has, has a propensity to sometimes when he's under turn pressure, he's yep. going to turn it over. He's going to throw it because he's going to sling it. Yep. And, you know, he can get chaotic sometimes scrambling. So I'm not saying he's not talented, but, uh, you know, I'm just, I, I'm not so sure. And if Texas A&M keeps moving along, Manziel, as a freshman, might be the best guy in the league at quarterback. Uh, they call him Johnny Football now out there. And he's got, they've got an interesting game with, at La Tech. There's actually in Shreveport, which was postponed from earlier in the year. Uh, but I, I, I not only like him a lot, like you, but it makes that second half Florida played against him mm -hmm. that much more impressive. Yeah. Because I think he had 46 or 56 yards, something like that, mm -hmm. in the whole second half. Mm -hmm. And we go to number three, and of course with the Florida Vanderbilt game coming up, this is certainly uh, something I think Alligator fans are thinking about. But, but start with you, Lee. And I don't know if you guys ever had this. This was not a term when you were playing. But how real are trap games? 
Actually, for my senior year when I was playing, Vanderbilt was a trap game. <laughs> we were undefeated. We were ranked around five, four right, right. at the time. We went to Vanderbilt and took it on the chin. And uh, Vanderbilt historically plays really well against Florida. And one of the things that I've always felt like you can do with Vanderbilt players, especially if they have a pretty good talent level, and from time to time, they do. You can really scheme for a game. Pretty right. sharp guys. Mm -hmm. Pretty yeah. sharp guys. So you, you go don't have up to worry there. That they're not getting it. Yeah, <laughs> by and large. So you go up there and you got a different environment, and the team. It's possible you can be blah because you just spent all your adrenal gland playing LSU. Mm -hmm. You know what's ahead. You know what's next week. But yeah. as Will Muschamp said, you and I were talking about this before we got on the air here. Said something that really struck me a, a couple of weeks ago is you can't ask your players to play up-tempo, fired up, give great effort if your game plan isn't that way. If right. you don't give them an aggressive game plan, and a lot of time what, times what happens with coaches in these games is they really temper their game plan, get conservative, and the players feel it. Of course, Trapp played for somebody. He, he, Spurrier didn't care who you were playing. He wanted right. to blow you out. But I also think he didn't give him any pregame talk or any Newt Rockney. He gave him a game plan, and he'll tell you. They were excited about playing because right. it was a game, and they knew he was going to let it go. So I think that uh, as long as they give him an aggressive game plan, these guys will keep playing like they've been playing. You know, Trav, you guys had a trap game up there in 96. Yeah. And, I mean, it came down to Real fourth close. and one. Danny Werfel having to get a yard, or yep. who knows what would have happened there. But, I mean, do you, did you feel it that week, and, and do you think mm. trap games are real? I think they're real. Um, I, I don't know that, that I could tell you anybody felt it during that week of preparation. Um, but I think when, when you play football, it's obviously, as we know, it's a very emotional game. And so it's not like you just walk out there, look at the game plan, physically you execute the game plan, and that's all it takes. And so it is hard over a 12, 13, 14 game season to be at your emotional peak every single week. And when you come off a game like we just did against LSU mm -hmm. or any big game where emotionally you really get jacked and then you think you're playing a lesser opponent followed by another big opponent, there can be a tendency to relax. Um, you try hard not to do it, but sometimes it's just human nature. And I think Will's point, your point, is really right on about the game plan. If you walk in on Monday or Sunday, whenever you first get together and look at that game plan, and it's boring and it's plain, and you can tell that these guys are attacking and defending in a very basic way, then you kind of take on that persona. You know, you kind of think, well, clearly we're just taking it easy this week. But if you go in the meeting room and you're looking at the game plan, you think, all right, we're coming out smoking, we are coming after them, we're trying right. to score 50 and shut them out then as a player, that's fun. Because it's always fun to go out there and perform and to do what you do and to be put in positions where you can be successful regardless of who the opponent is. Yeah, and I think Will understands that. You know, okay. he's, I think he'll fall right into line with that because we've seen that. You know, he keeps saying it was only one win, wasn't one and a half. Uh, number four, what's a better story this year so far? Duke, one win away from a bowl game, Travis, or Penn State winning four straight after their tough start? That's a tough one. Um, I'm probably going to go with the Penn State situation. It, uh, I think what Coach O'Brien has done there, kind of just dealing with such an impossible situation. Right. You know, first you have to convince your team to stay and not jump ship. Their best running back goes out to USC. Um, just incredibly tough to deal with. And the fact that they've reeled off four in a row. And I think you can tell, Pat, I haven't seen lots of their games, but the bits and pieces I have seen – those players like him. Mm -hmm. They want to play for him. They're fighting and scrapping and, and really doing a heck of a job. And the university is rallying around them. And that's, that's a good thing to see um, because of the, you know, just enormous, disastrous situation that they've had to deal with up there. And, uh, and I think it speaks to how good of an X's and O's coach he is. Right. Right. I think well, he's really good. Well, they could be 6-0. I mean, they could. They're very they close to being They were up on Ohio sure. and, yep. and blew it. And then, of course, they had to miss field goals in their second game. Uh, you may be talking, though, Lee, about the two coaches of the year in their respective conferences. If Cutcliffe goes 8-4 and four at Duke, you should automatically – should you shouldn't even vote on it. And, and certainly if Bill O'Brien, with everything, the way everybody's falling apart in the Big Ten, 
would certainly have a chance for that. Yeah, cut, cut those that Tennessee may be wishing how, or wondering how come they ever <laughs> let him get away. That's right. Which yeah. one's a bigger story? For I, you? I'm with Trav. I, Penn State. That, that, that was an unprecedented tragedy in maybe all of uh, all of sport. Um, and it wasn't the players' Penn. fault. That's it, the thing. That it, it, exactly. And they, they um, you know, they, they've they've really suffered and their character, which is a overused word, uh, but they really are exhibiting that from the coaching staff to the players. I, I, I think it's, uh, I think from a human standpoint, what they're doing right. to work through all of that is pretty amazing. And of course, they, you know, they have a big win. What happens, what's the big story this week? Jerry Sandusky gets sentenced. So I know. They can't get away from it, but maybe this will be the end of it. I know they'll have all kinds of lawsuits, but, and again, I'm mad at the school, but I'm certainly not mad at the players and the coaches. Yeah. We go to number five, the final one. Give me one team that's going to be in the national championship game that's not named Alabama or Oregon League. Not Alabama or Oregon, so I'm eliminating one and two. Well, if I'm a real homer, I'll say Florida. How do you like that? But I would like that. I yeah. would like that very much. Well, it's, we don't uh, like that. You don't know how good they treat the media in those PCS games. <laughs> you know what, and, and I'm not saying I thoroughly believe this, but if you go back to the early 90s, and look at the Alabama team mm -hmm. that marched its way to the national championship. They, yeah. they didn't do it any more pretty than this Gator team is doing it right That's now. True. It was squeakers. And I hate to bring this up, that in 1998, there was a Tennessee team that Florida was better than, and they grinded their way into the national championship. And every win uh, was, was ugly. Florida, if they played them Ten times, in my opinion, would have beat them nine, but they grinded their way to the national championships. I don't think it's impossible, but just consider that. But West Virginia is yeah. the one where all the lights are on and it's it's sizzling. Doesn't seem out of the question. When you brought that '98 game up, I don't know who side more, Travis or me, because I, I had my wife up there. We, it was like you know, big deal because Florida never loses to Tennessee. Everybody'll have a blast. Yeah. That was a somber yeah. ride back to the yeah. hotel. No, that was, that you, was you know, breaker. You got me thinking about it now. <laughs> <laughs> that team ends up winning the national title and going undefeated. And if you remember the preview, or actually two weeks before that, because they always had a bye before us, they played Syracuse right. at Syracuse and snuck by and barely beat them. Then they barely beat us, then they kind of got going. But we played them up there. We had seven turnovers, Pat. I remember seven. that. Seven. Two of them inside the five. Mm -hmm. And we lose on a field goal we should have made in overtime, and that's the team that wins the national title. Didn't and really? they play Florida State, that's the exactly team that right. we also should have beat at the should end of the year. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. If, if Gerard so. Warren falls yeah. on the fumble in the end zone. Right. But didn't Terry Jackson fumble one going in, I think? Twice. Yeah, yeah Twice. literally going into the end Sorry, Terry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mean believe me, that's, <laughs> if I ever, it's a bad ever, day for everybody. I had a fumble, too. I Travis Taylor had a fumble. I don't know if I've ever done my list of pain, most painful losses, but I think that would happen. Register in there. Who's your team, though, that'll be in Miami? Um, you know, I'm probably going to agree with the West Virginia thing. And, and Pat, right before we, we came on here, we were kind of talking about it real quick. And um, I, I was kind of racking my brain, having a hard time. I think Florida State before last week right. was kind of the sexy pick. Everybody thinks that the talent level is, is back up again. They had looked um, pretty good in the previous games. And then obviously they lose to NC State, so they're kind of out of the mix. Anybody from the SEC. I do think. South Carolina. Yeah, South Carolina, Florida. I think we're capable if you can handle that run. But West Virginia, with the conference they play in, with the way they look on offense, with Geno Smith at quarterback, who's you know becoming a Heisman front runner and doing some incredible things. They're so productive on offense. They're going to have a very easy road to get right, there. Right. Now, if they get there, I don't know that they can hang with who they're going to be playing because it's probably going to be somebody from the SEC. Uh, but the question was who would be in Miami other than Alabama and Oregon. They probably have a good shot. Well, it'll be interesting. I'm, I'm voting for Florida just because of the way they treat the media. But uh, <laughs> the BCS, the, the games are unbelievable. Yeah. But, uh, hey, we appreciate Lee McGriff and Travis McGriff for coming in. Uh, it's been a great panel. We're going to take a break, come back with the list. Okay, it's time for the list where we're going to talk about five things that I have uh, been running around in my brain. And this is, you know, we're at that point in October, and I usually don't even think too much about it till October. But in October, I start thinking about the Heisman Trophy voting because I'm a voter, Robbie's a voter, and you have to start kind of getting in your mind how you're going to vote. And I, I know a lot of guys will be talking about Heisman front runners after the first game. Come on, be serious. 
Well, we all know Geno Smith's a front runner right now, and it's going to be hard to beat him out. But I, the list today is the five Heisman candidates who you don't have to worry about. They don't have to worry about getting a suit to be ready to go to New York, I don't think, in my opinion. Number one, Monte Ball from Wisconsin. And, I mean, he's, his numbers aren't terrible. I mean, he's, he's rushed for over 500 yards, but Wisconsin's not any good. Uh, it, it's just he's not having a Heisman season. And you know, unfortunately, it, it comes down to the best player on the best, one of the best teams. Now, Tim Tebow kind of broke the mold when Florida went 9-3 and three and he won it. But still, for the most part, it's somebody from – it's going to be in Alabama, Oregon, West Virginia. You know, some of the, somebody like that will probably win it. And, again, that's one reason Geno Smith got such a big lead on it everybody. If West Virginia loses a couple of games, it's going to be hard for them. But Monty Ball, who's been a good back, not a great back, certainly not a Heisman winning back, and I don't think there's anything he can do the rest of the way because the Big Ten is so bad. Number two, E.J. Manuel, who kind of was, an, was a dark horse before the year, and then with the Clemson game, got a lot of momentum, and people were fired up, and they were thinking, man, this could be a guy who could win the Heisman Trophy. But when you get shut out in the second half and your team needs you to score points, Two would have been enough. But when you get shut out in the second half on the road and lose a game and lose your shot at a national title, I'm sorry. No matter – he could throw for 8 million yards the rest of the year. I wouldn't vote for him for the Heisman because I think when his team needed him, he couldn't get it done. Now, it's not all one guy. We all know that. I'm, I, I'm not blaming E.J. Manuel for that. I'm just saying the way the Heisman people vote. And, again, I, I've said this a million times. There's probably an obit writer in Spokane who's got a – a Heisman vote. I think it's, there's way too many voters. They should cut it in, uh, th by a third and let the people who really follow college football vote on it, but that's not the way it works. So I'm going more for not so much with, with my ballot, but all of this is pretty much it. What I, I perceive as a national perception. Can you say that perceive as perception? I just did. Uh, number three, Niall Davis. Niall Davis, again, was a guy who was just kind of out, you know, dark horse, got a chance he was a really good back, but obviously we all know what's going on at Arkansas. Uh, there is nothing in the world he could do outside of maybe, you know, uh, ending wars and, and uh, jumping from here to Mars and back to, to win the Heisman. Uh, he's been okay for them, not even great. And certainly when your team is in the tank, uh, and a good win last week, but still they're in the tank, uh, you're, and you don't play well, you're never going to win the Heisman. He's definitely out. Number four, Denard Robinson. You know, against the best teams, he's been shut down. That's not the sign of a Heisman winner. Notre Dame shut him down. Alabama shut him down. He threw, what, four picks against Notre Dame in about five minutes. You're not a Heisman winner. And, uh, you know, you just have to go and do the best you can. Now, they had a nice win last week, so maybe they'll get it going the right direction. But it's over. These guys, it's over for all these guys. And number five, I reluctantly put Matt Barkley on this list. Matt Barkley not only had the loss, hasn't – Played overwhelmingly good for much of this, for the you know during that two game stretch there. Came back last week against a Utah team that's pretty average, and and did rally them to win. But that's not enough. I see some people still think he's got a shot. I don't. I think it's done for him. And I, you know again he he could do some great things. And they've got a big game against Oregon. The the reason I, did I say Oregon is what I was trying to say. I think I said Oregon, but Oregon. The reason I reluctantly put him on this list is if he puts up great stats and goes out and beats Oregon, which is the only thing really between them and a national title, then he might sneak back on that ballot. Might get a trip to New York. But we'll see. At any rate, that's going to do it for today's show. And we uh, appreciate you guys clicking on. Don't forget, we've got our uh, radio podcast up, the Beach Boys podcast, the Swampcast. We've got so many diff different things we're trying to give you guys, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, very much. Thanks again to Lee and Travis McGriff as well for coming on board. Until next time, Pat Dooley, sports columnist of the Gainesville Sun, saying so long from the Sunshine State. <laughs>